in North Philadelphia. Uh, we th- welcome those of you that are online today, and we welcome you, those that are in person. It is the last Sunday in August, so we know a lot of people are traveling, um, getting ready to rest before all the activities of the fall. But God is present, and we know that God is present with our church family that is away as well. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, ask Him to be with us this service, and spend time um, hearing from Him. Amen? We thank you that you are present. We thank you that you are present even when our hearts are far from you, that you call us to yourself and you um, invite us back into your presence and you offer forgiveness and you offer grace. And I pray for those today that are far from you, Lord, that you would call them back to yourself, that they would discover again the power of your love to redeem and change us and deliver us from sin and the destructions of, of sin. God, I pray for those that are in fellowship with you that are traveling today, that you would be with them, that you would give them safety on the roads and in the air, that you would bless time with family and bless time and rest, and that they would be refreshed and ready as they follow you in this world. And for those that are present, God, I pray that you would speak to us through your word, that your word would reveal who you are, would reveal the truth of who you are, would convict us of sin and and would restore us into relationship with you. And Lord, I pray that you would give your people a passion to please you, a passion for your word and a passion for obedience. And Lord, that our hearts would look at the world the way that you look at the world and we would be a changed people. And Lord, that we would invite your spirit to work in and through us, not only in this service, but as we leave this service and as we serve you throughout the week. Be with us today. May you um, guide us into all truth and help us to hear and listen to you. Amen. And Christina is coming to read the Old Testament passage this morning. Psalm 93. Uh, here I am with you in the God's Word, please. Uh, I read the Old Testament scriptures, Psalm 93. The Lord... Reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty. And all with strength. And being the, the, the world is established firm and secure. The throne was established long ago. We are from all eternity. The seas the seas have lifted up Lord. The seas have lifted up their voice. The seas have lifted up their pounding ways. Mightier than the thunder of the great waters, mightier than the breakers of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. The statues, Lord, stand firm. Holiness adorns the house in these days. May the Lord add a blessing to the name of his world.
chapter 1, verse 1 through 23. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to God's holy people, the Colossians, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. Thanksgiving and prayers. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all of God's people. The faith and love that springs from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the world, the whole world, just as, has, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from a perverse, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ and on our behalf and who also told us of your love and in the spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the spirit is, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. The supremacy of the Son of God. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your mind because of your evil behavior, but now has, he has reconciled you by Christ physical body through death to present to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, establish and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become concerned. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Please be seated. You've all been so patient. Appreciate that. Let's go to the big God's house. Amen. Amen. We are going to go to the Lord in prayer, but uh, before we do that, I do want to take just a moment to uh, thank our prayer launch team. Prayer launch team, you've been so faithful. We haven't really, um, as we promised, Thank you all today with our prayer needs, other than those of you who are watching the stream, we never really got our website together, but I know that you've been praying, 
because wonderful things have been happening. Amen. Far above what we uh, could have thought and imagined uh, at this time, the Lord has been very gracious, 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 and great, graceful to us, and we're grateful. Um, so, yeah, just to highlight a couple of needs, we're getting ready to start the uh, new school year at Spring Garden Academy. Just pray that God would keep his hand on the church, especially in the area of hiring. If you follow the news, you know that there is a lot of difficulty in finding employees, especially in the uh, teaching field. But God knows that. And uh, this is, you know, God's school, God's ministry, so we trust him. But please continue to lift that up with us. Uh, help us to reach out to our community and our school families. Uh, we are doing our part. We're doing our best to shine the light and make it available. And we just trust that, you know, the Bible says if Jesus is lifted up, he said, I will draw all men and women to me. So we are trusting for that. Um, ask continued blessing on our interns as they are making their next steps. And, um, hey, what can we pray with you about? We would love to hear from you. Um, just to say hi, just to let us know that you know, you're still out there. Um, and also, if you have any prayer needs, we want to pray for you as well, pray with you as well. And uh, we are actually going to go into a time of prayer right now. Just wanted to uh, highlight, we got a um, contact through Facebook from uh, a lady named Charlene, who asked that the church would lift her up in prayer. So we are going to pray for her. And we don't need to go into all the details. We can disagree with her. And uh, God knows the need, and uh, God is moving in a powerful way. We know that there are many among us, and some who are not able to be with us today who need a physical touch. And um, thank the Lord, you know, we're going to talk about, and is going to talk about um, the ways that God moves in the physical healing today. And we can all be encouraged by that. Um, Karen's grandson, is there an update on him? Pray for uh, Anna and for Say. Any other needs, if you just like to raise your hand, um, and we will agree with you again, we might know what the need is, but God knows if there's something to like for us to pray with you about, we would certainly be happy to hear with that. Lord, we thank you so much for your faithfulness. We thank you, Father, that um, not only do we know that you're working, but we can see that you're at work, and we at work, and we can see the wonderful, marvelous deeds that you have done, and that you continue to do with us as we surrender our lives to you, and as we surrender our needs to you. Lord, I lift up, first of all, the needs of those who are here today, those who may be watching online. Father, I just pray that you would give us the assurance that you have heard and that you have answered prayer. And Lord, any who may be distracted by pain, who may be distracted by illness, just pray, Father, that you would give them a special touch right now, because we know that you have something special to do here in this service, and we don't want anything to distract us from what you would desire to, uh, to, to happen today. Lord, we lift up those who are in need of a physical uh, touch, Father, in particular, those who are with us and those who may be watching. But we also looked up Charlene, who, uh, Charlene, who contacted us through the website and through Facebook. But we just pray that you administer her in a powerful and special way and that you would show your love to her and uh, show the power of prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be your ambassadors here in this nice town today with the neighborhood. We thank you, Father, for uh, our neighbors, the ones we know, the ones whom we don't know yet. Lord, we thank you for the mission field that comes to the door every day, Lord, at the school. Father, we just pray that you would help us, that you would give us your grace, that you would send us laborers, Father, and that you would just multiply our ability to um, reflect your light and to shine it brightly on this community that is around us, Lord God. We know that you're not willing that any should perish, and that you love every single soul here in our neighborhood, Father. So we just pray that you would help us to be effective. We pray for other ministries who are uh, reaching out to this neighborhood, Father, that you would strengthen them, and that we would find ways to support them and they us, Lord God, that your will might be done right here in our backyard. Father, we pray for those all over the city, all over this country, and all over the world. Father, there are many people who are in fear. There are many people who are hungry. There are many people who are seeking answers. Lord God, we just pray that your Holy Spirit would be poured out in a mighty way, and that your church would rise up, and that we would really be your blessing, Father, that we would be salt, and that we would be light, that we would be a preservative, and that we would uh, sort of head towards Jesus wherever we are. Thank you, Father, for meeting with us today and for the marvelous things that you have already planned for our time together. I pray that you would be glorified. Amen. At this time, Amaya is coming forward to share some announcements with us. September 1st from 5 to 8 p.m. We have a night of dinner, worship, and prayer. 
Thank you, Anaya. And um, just wanted to say thank you for all of you for being faithful to the God to, to God to God and uh, tithes and offerings. Um, you know, we stress this over and over again that yes, we resurrection life as a church. Um, we definitely need your contributions, whether they seem large or small to you. you know, I think like only have a little bit to give. It doesn't make that much difference. But you know, whatever we put in God's hands, that's what God is able to multiply. Um, five loaves and three fish, He was able to feed thousands of people. Um, so that's the one aspect of it. But you know, we really stress giving because it's important as a uh, spiritual discipline. It is something that we need to develop. Um, we are going to be um, underdeveloped spiritually if we aren't being faithful to God. So there are many things that we give. You know, we give our time, we give our prayers, we give financially as God enables us to do that. Um, you've always been so faithful, and you know, we count on the fact that as we are faithful to God, it is God who makes the difference. So once again, thank you for continuing to be faithful in your ties and offerings. And Lord, we thank you that you are faithful to us as well. We ask Lord, that you would bless the funds that are given today, the bless the, the ones that are given here in person, the ones that are given at give that rose life that we believe um, online. And Father, we just pray that you will be done. Amen. Are we ready for the word of God today? Thank you, Noah, for giving the announcements. I did want to um, just reiterate Thursday night. Thursday is the day we welcome all our staff back. And we are really pleased that Noah and, and Giovanni are actually on the SGA staff now. You can give them a big hand. And uh, we welcome and we start our year with prayer. And we start our year giving all of our energy to hearing from God, right? So on Thursday night, we invite the church family to join the school family so that we're one in ministry, that we're walking together, right? Because the people here that serve every day represent us, right? They represent um, what God is doing here. And so we are going to eat dinner at 5, and then we'll have a time of worship. Alexis is preparing. If anybody else wants to help her, she'd be glad. Um, and we're going to hear from the Lord through His Word, and we're going to just pray and say, at the start of this year, this ministry is about Jesus. It's not about the teachers of SGA, and it's not about the people sitting here. It's about Jesus. And we expect that the Spirit of God will move because we're obedient to what He's called us to do. Amen? So if you're not working, if you're praying at night, even if you can come for a short time, and it will do great things, right? It will build us up, even just to come and pray for Giovanni, and for now, I say, you're starting your career here. Let, let, I just want you to know I'm going to pray for you every day because what you're doing to represent the kingdom matters. Amen? That's my little plug. All right. So here we go. We're going to Mark chapter 4, verse 35 today. We want to start off with um, just a reminder that we get a mission. The way we define the mission of RLC, a resurrection life church, Spring Garden Academy, is to say, as we follow Jesus, we're reaching people with the love of Jesus, right? We're teaching them the truth of Jesus according to the scripture, um, according to what the Spirit teaches us through the scripture. What a place of mending. When people come into the kingdom of God, it's a place to heal. Because Jesus is the great healer. And he heals us not in our bodies, only in our bodies, but he heals us in our minds and our spirits. He heals us in relationships, teaching us how to live together. And then our big goal is to send people back out, because there are people all over the world that still do not know the name of Jesus, who still don't have that hope. Right, so that's what we're all about. And I believe today, as we go to the stories that we're looking at in the book of Mark, you'll see all four of these taking place. All right? You'll see Jesus reaching people with his love. You'll see him teaching. We did a lot of teaching last week with the study on the parables. You'll see people healed. 
And then you'll see that he heals somebody, he sends them out to ten cities to go preach the gospel. So we have a great example in the scripture today, but I'm going to ask that as we go to the scripture, we ask the Lord, what are you teaching me about all this, Jesus? How do you want me to respond? Well, how can I be a part? Okay, so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Jesus, we thank you that you have called us to walk as your children. You have given us your spirit. You have cleansed us and given us a new life, a new hope, and a new future. And oh God, I pray that as we abide in with you and spend time in your presence, that we experience your love and we find the pouring out of your spirit in our lives, Lord, that we would be on mission with you, that we would desire to follow you even into hard areas, places that we don't understand because we know your presence. I pray that you would encourage your people today. I pray that you would soften our hearts and help us to apply your word to our present day lives, Lord, and that we would be pleasing in how we respond and we would be obedient as we go into the world this week. In your name we pray. Amen. So I did want to say this too. I think the disciples of Jesus, I believe everybody here has been part of the church for a while, at least in person. We've been talking about walking with Jesus, right? So Sunday mornings are great because we get a message and we get some encouragement. But we have purpose this time to really study the book of Mark as a church because Mark gives a very clear example of how Jesus calls, what Jesus does, who Jesus is, and how we're then to respond. It's a really short book. So I'm going to encourage you, if you have not yet done this, during the week sometimes, sit down and just read the book of Mark. It's great to do this on Sunday. We get some in-depth teaching. But if you want to hear... Um, the message that Mark wanted to communicate, he wrote a letter, right? He wrote this letter, and he said, let me tell you everything I know. And let me tell you the truth of who Jesus is so you can make this decision for yourself. So if you um, have time, I would say just make time. It's less than an hour, really. It goes fast. 13, 13 or 16 chapters. I'm forgetting that's the top of my head right here. 16. I, and if you don't like to read, there are so many great audio versions. There's some with music. There's some written in, like, hip-hop style. The Word of God is out there. Maybe we'll send some of those to you through the week. BibleGateway.com. Go right, start right there. You can find multiple versions. Just say, Spirit of God, I'm learning this in services, but can you just give me an experience with you in your Word one-on-one, right, so that you can teach me during the week. All right. Now it's time to start. Are we ready? That was my little plug. All right. Today's sermon is Jesus, Our Powerful King. And we're going to read four stories. But let's think a minute about that word power, right? In our culture, who has power? The wealthy, celebrities, those those influencers, right? Online influencers and whatever social media you're using today. Political leaders. I think for us as 21st century people, we're a little jaded by power. We, we watch people come and go, right? We have a long history to look back at. We know the person that's on Instagram today might not be there a year from now. We know that people in power, they eventually die. Kingdoms come and kingdoms go. All right? We see the lust for power. And, and sometimes even as Christians, we can step back and say, Ugh, power, I, I don't know. What's that power? Power is not all that great. It, it's useful. People use it. But... Power. We don't really have great examples of power that's good. And so, what, what do we do in our culture? We create superheroes, right? Who's Iron Man and who's Captain America, right? We have we have our favorites, right? Superheroes. And yet, even in our culture, Captain America, Black Panther, whoever you love, they're always flawed characters. You notice? They never can truly have true power overall. They have extra power. They have superpower. But even with their superpowers, they get into fights with each other, right? Avengers Civil War. What's it all about? Who's going to win, right? And in the process, even when they use their power, they destroy innocent people. And so that's the examples we have of power. We tend to think of power as just what we can control. And then everything supernatural or bigger than us is either fictional or it's short-lived and it doesn't really have a purpose. But today we're going to look at Jesus. I want us to imagine that one of those first century disciples who maybe have only known Jesus less than a year, some of them, this is pretty early in his ministry, where he begins to do some of these work, and they see him healing people, they see things happening, but today they're going to have an encounter with God that reminds them that he is power overall. He's not just, doesn't just have power, he is the power, right? He's the source of all power. 
And it's easy to read these passages quickly and just say, okay, okay, oh yeah, that's nice, I can draw a picture. No, think about what would it mean to be in a boat with Jesus and to see his power fully unleashed, even for a moment. And what would that, if that, we walked around with that vision every day, how would we approach the, the um, triumphs and tragedies of this life? Well, remember, it's the same Jesus. Amen? So here we go. We're looking at four stories today that show the power of, the, of Jesus as God. Um, some of you may know them already. This may be a first time for you as well. First is Jesus calms the storm. Jesus restores a man possessed by demons. Jesus heals a woman with a bleeding disorder. And Jesus raises to life a dying girl. Four stories. All taking place the way Mark arranges them within, within a couple days of each other at the most. And happening very quickly. And in those actions, we already have last week in the parables, right? Jesus proclaiming himself as king. And so we're going to see in his actions, he shows his power very quickly, four times, to say, I am the king of all. So we are going to see in these passages, on all four of them, we'll see that Jesus exercises power. Not to be an iron man, right? Not to to say, I'm cool, I got this extra thing, or I'm going to save the world, and I'm going to fly around the air. He exercises his power to establish himself as God. That he is the authority, the one who has come to do the work that God has, and he is God. We will see the crowds, the disciples, those healed, respond both with fear and faith, depending on what they believe about Jesus. And then we'll walk away challenged once again to say, what is his claim over our lives? So let's start with that first story. I'm going to spend most of our time today on that first story. If I can't go in too long, because I just found this so fascinating, I'll be honest. I was all over looking at pictures. You're going to see them. Um, when we get to, um, if the story gets too long, Otis will cut us off, and we can um, do some email about the last couple passages. But we're going to start with this wonderful story. Jesus calms the storm. Mark 4. That day, and just when it says that day, I want you to, to if you look in your Bible, go to the book, um, beginning of chapter 4. The beginning of chapter 4, Jesus is, has so many crowds around him while he's teaching the um, disciples to put him in a boat and put him on the, out in the water so he can keep from the water. It's that day that we're talking about. That very same day, all of chapter 4 that Mark gives us those parables, he's framing in at the end of a very long teaching day. All right, so here we go. This is the day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, will you care if we drown? He got up. He rebuked the wind and the waves and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to the disciples, What are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. This is a very detailed, this is a very short story, but it's very detailed, right? We have all these details. It's evening, it's the same day he was preaching from the boat. Um, he, and then he uses that phrase, just as he was, meaning that Jesus didn't get to go have a meal, didn't get back in travel, he didn't go to go change his clothes, he just stayed in the boat, and they were whisking him out, out across um, the Sea of Galilee. Other boats are surrounding, I don't know, how, I never picked this up as a child, but other boats were surrounding, so the people that witnessed this miracle were not just the 12 disciples, there were other people traveling with them, smaller boats and disciples going along with them. He's on a cushion. It doesn't just say he went to sleep. It says he's on a cushion in the stern. The back, I guess that's the back of the boat. I'm not a boater. And then the description of the storm. Why, is all, why are all these details important? What does it suggest? It suggests that Mark is giving an eyewitness account. Uh, biblical historians do not believe it was Mark. They believe it was Peter. And Peter spent time at the end of his life with Mark. And we know that Mark, um, many of the stories in the, God, in the book of Mark were written from of Peter's recollections. Peter traveled with Jesus from the beginning. And it was such a powerful event that in Peter telling the story over and over again, Mark got all the details. All those little details that don't really necessarily advance the story, but show us that this was something that stood out in their memories 
as a disciple that shaped the way that they began to understand Jesus. So, let's look at the boat. Remember we said, you got the boat up here? So we think the boat looked like this. We, I'm like, as if I'm a biblical, biblical scholar. No, biblical scholars think the boat looked like this. And they think about 10 to 15 people are on the boat. And they know this because they've actually done quite a bit of archaeological research, and they found an almost intact boat from the, about the time that we know Christ was traveling in Galilee and the fishermen were there. So we know that they were not very large boats, but that he had been in that boat all day. So how do you think Jesus felt in the boat all day? Teaching with no microphone. I had a microphone in this room of, you know, I don't really need a microphone. I'm pretty loud. But can you imagine... Jesus is, this is the shore, and you're all the way over there, and Jesus is preaching and teaching, and he's got some people not believing him, and he's, he's also bringing his disciples to the side, and the people have to eat, and they have to take care of their personal needs, and at the end of the day, it's evening, Jesus is tired, very tired, and he's so tired, he goes to sleep in the middle of the storm. And let's look a little bit more into the story. We see the Sea of Galilee. So the Sea of Galilee is going to show up. We're going to go back and forth. You're going to see in, the next, in these four stories, Jesus going back and forth across the sea. It's actually a lake. Um, you can still go to it today. I really want to go, Otis. I just thought about this last night. We really need to go. It's actually a freshwater lake. And we know that many of the disciples were fishermen, and they would have spent their lives in this what we, we call the Sea of Galilee, what they called um, the Galilee was the region where Jesus lived and taught at this time. He lived on the west side of, and we'll, I'll show you a map a little bit later, but he would have been going through those towns, but he always hugged the shore because that's where the people were congregating, because that's where most people were making their living, off of the sea, or right? off that freshwater lake. Um, it was only 13 by 8 miles, which seems pretty big, but I always thought it was like an ocean when I was a kid, like Jesus walking on the ocean, right? No, it was a, a, a lake that they could cross in a day, um, but it was something that they were very, very familiar with. Storms were very common, historically, and they still are today, because it sits 600, degree, um, 600 feet below sea level, and then there's mountains on one side. So you have the coolness of the mountains coming down, and you have the warmth of the plains, and of the, you know, down in the valley. And so it was common for um, these disciples, particularly Peter, James, and John, with the fishermen, right? They would have been experiencing this kind of thing before. So what they experienced in the boat, we know it has to be really tremendous because it causes them to wake Jesus after a long day of ministry. And when they wake him, they don't wake him and say, help us, help us. They're mad that he's falling asleep and, and leaving them to kind of suffer alone, right? So this, this marvelous storm comes up. They had genuine fear. And they expressed their fear. Their first response was fear. This was a storm like they had not known before, even though they had worked those waters for very many years. And what does Jesus do? Just think about this, right? The boat is on the waters in the boat. They don't know how they're going to get their experienced fishermen. They don't know how they're getting themselves out. And Jesus just stands up and he says, I grew up, it was peace, be still. I think that's KGV, right? But quiet. Be still. And the verbs, and I don't know Greek, but the verbs used by Mark suggest that it was immediate stillness. It wasn't like it took 20 minutes to calm down. The waves stopped, the wind stopped, and the boat was calm. It's a lot, isn't it? It's a lot. I just can't imagine. And why is this so important? Well, we know that storms, in, in all cultures, right, storms represent something that's uncontrollable. Right. Um, let's look at, in ancient cultures, there were always gods of the sea. Let's put the first one up. Oh, the first one. Who is that? Da-da-da, da-da-da. Right? Because Chaitan was the, um, the son of uh, Poseidon, who was a Greek god. The Greeks were influenced in the culture of Jesus' day. Everybody believed that there was a god of the sea. Uh, not, not Jesus and the Jews, but they believed people of the region would have believed that there's a god of the sea. The Romans had their god. It was uh, Neptune. You've heard of all this, right? We still today, we have our own culture, right? Old man in the sea. We have Moby Dick going up the sea. But there's something about the sea that we as humans know that we cannot control. And the only one who can control it is God. We cannot harness the power of the sea. It has to be controlled by the divine. And when Jesus stands up, and he rebukes the sea and the storms he inserts, and it's very clear to them 
that he is asserting his authority as God. That's why they're terrified. Do you ever think why they're terrified after the storm? They're afraid before, and then after, they're suddenly terrified. Well, think about it. it doesn't, it, I don't find this hard to imagine at all. If I'm traveling with somebody, and they're my friend, and I think they're a great teacher, and I'm following them, and I'm supporting them, and all of a sudden, and I realize, ooh, they're not just my friend and a great teacher. It's God. It's God. He has that much power. This man who is sleeping, this human who is so tired he falls asleep in the storm, is also God. It's a, this, all that teaching they had um, from the parables, all the you know, that Jesus had already been revealed, suddenly gets revealed in his action when he says, I got it. Right? And notice Jesus doesn't pray to God the Father and say, Oh, God the Father, if you care about me, please stop this storm. He just stands up and says, No, it's over. Storm's over. And then he turns to them and says, Why don't you have faith? Not faith in that he can do it, but faith that he is God. Why do you lack the faith? Let's go to, um, not only did, you know, we said the Greeks and the Romans, they had their gods, but the, the people traveling with them were mostly Jewish. I think they were all Jewish at this point. They knew that there were stories in the Bible about someone sleeping in a boat and the storms coming. Anybody remember what story in the Bible? Um, in the Old Testament, a really big story of the whole Old Testament was somebody gets in a boat, falls asleep, and the storms come. We're going to go into the book of Jonah. Remember the book of Jonah? So the book of Jonah, we're going to read part of it, but the story of Jonah is, is simply this. Jonah is called by God to go to a city to preach the gospel or to preach the goodness of God to people who are not Jewish. He does not like it. He runs from God. He ends up in a boat. God sends a storm. He gets thrown into the sea. Um, and we're going to look at that passage. He gets eaten up by a fish. He spends three three days in the, bo- in the belly of a fish, whatever that means. Gets thrown up on the water and still is hard to God after all that. But the story of Jonah would have been well, well known to the disciples. And let's look at that first part of the story of Jonah. And then we're going to look again at what is Jesus saying by his actions to show that he is truly God. Here we go. The word of the God came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. And the Lord set a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid and cried out each to his own God. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone down below deck, where he lay, and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that he, we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they said to him, Tell us who is responsible for making all of this trouble for us. What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? What? For what people are you? So they're desperate, right? Some God has to be behind. we got to find some God to help us. Jonah answers, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them, and they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, what should we do to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into it, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. And they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, Lord, have done as you please. And they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. In this story of Jonah, Jonah establishes that it's God himself that controls the sea, and it's only God who can bring the seas to calm, right? And he even goes to the point and says, I'm in disobedience, get rid of me so that the Lord will act, and he calls out for mercy to the Lord on the rest of the ship. But it's true, it's not just on Neptune, it's the God. The God that he serves that will bring the calm. And it's so convincing that the whole, the whole ship breaks. 
to the God and thanks him, right, for delivering him. So in the story of Jonah, calm comes to the sea when Jonah calls out to God, when he recognizes that God is in control, and he removes himself, recognizing God's judgment on him. But the story of Jesus, if you look at them side by side, Jesus is no Jonah, is he? Because Jesus is not running away from God. He is running him on mission with God. He gets in that boat so that he can preach, and he stays in that boat so he can travel to preach some more. And he's resting in his human form. He's tired, but he's saying, I'm on mission with you. And so when the storm comes, he doesn't have to pray to God because he's God, and he stands up and he calms the storm. Mark's first readers would have understood that. This is no Jonah. This is the one who calms the storm. He doesn't pray. He just does it. There's no appeal. He does it with his words, and it happens immediately. So what do we learn from this story? Isn't that a great story? Everybody say amen. Isn't that a great story? If, if, if we don't know who Jesus is, you know, we go back to this. Either someone's lying or Jesus is who he says he is. He's all-powerful. But in this story, we see, first of all, that Jesus is, is both human and God. A very clear picture. He's tired. He hasn't eaten or taken care of his needs, right? Um, he goes to sleep. But he, he establishes authority over nature. He demonstrates his complete power and authority over nature itself. And then the story continues in that he confronts a lack of faith in his disciples. And it's, you know, I think it's easy for us to sit back and say, well, why didn't they understand? He already told them. They just, they just started following him. And they were pretty good disciples. They had left their jobs already, left their families, were taking care of his physical needs, were learning from him day by day. But he had not yet, they had not yet seen that um, clearly that, that Jesus was who he said he was. He wasn't just a Messiah. He was the Messiah, the Son of God, God himself, coming in human form. And that storm shook them up, right? They were terrified because they realized the implications of what they had just witnessed. And yet they hadn't yet had that faith, and they're learning to develop that faith, right? And then the last thing I want to say about the story of Jonah is that Jonah has to be thrown over so that the, the others will be saved. And we're going to see a parallel in the life of Jesus. Let me just um, explain this. So jo- Jonah starts on a boat during a storm, running away from God, running away from mission. The mission he was called to was to proclaim who God was to the lost Nineveh. They were not a Jewish city. They were a Gentile city. And he thought it was beneath them, and he didn't want God to save them. He actually said, I don't want them to be saved. And so Jonah is running away from God. He's then thrown into the sea, and he spends three days in the belly of a fish before being caught up on the land as to complete the mission that God had given him. And he still does it with the speed of, um, spirit of disobedience, even after all of that. Now think about Jesus. Jesus is on a boat, sleeping during a storm, but pursuing the mission. The mission to save the lost. He does not appeal to God. The sea does not um, master him, but he masters the sea. And later, if we read the entire book, that's why I want you to go home and read it someday. Read the entire book. It becomes really clear. Later, who spends three days in darkness? Jesus, right? He, he's crucified on a Friday, Saturday, he's dead, Sunday, he rises. That's how, that's how they mark three days in Hebrew culture. Any part of a day was part of, you counted it, right? But Jesus does not go into a belly of a whale. Jesus confronts sin and darkness directly. He conquers it. He's not conquered by it. He conquers it. And he becomes a sign of what Jonah could not do, right? Because when he conquers that, then all are invited into the kingdom of God, all Gentiles. Not just the city of Nineveh, but all of us today as well. And we're going to see that continue in the next story. Am I going too long over today? All right, let's go to the next story. And so one of I'm going to show you in a map in a minute and just think about how that Jesus just did all this teaching in a boat. He calms the storm. He gets to the other side. Let's see what happens. Other side of the Galilee. They went across the lake. And remember, the Sea of Galilee is a lake. So you're going to hear it called the Sea of Galilee. Sometimes it's going to be referred to as the lake. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. The man lived in the tombs, and no one could bring him any, could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he's often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons at his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Not in day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. 
He showed her to the top of his voice. What do you want from me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. But Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Virgin, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again not to send him out of the area. A large crowd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, Send us among the pigs, but we're also going to them. He gave them permission, and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those ten in the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their area, their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how much he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. So let's look at a quick map here. So we know Jesus was probably around here when he was teaching. Not quite. We look at all three of the four, um, four Gospels. He's somewhere in this region. And he took that boat right across to um, this area. Okay? And this is important because on the other side, Jesus was from this region. He grew up in Galilee. It was the Jewish region. Um, it was part of the old northern part of Israel. But over here was not. It was mostly Greek city that had been taken over by Rome. So when Jesus goes across the lake, he is going to a new culture. He is leaving his homeland where, where Jews were even teaching Jews and going into a Gentile community. And most biblical scholars believe this because of the pigs, right? In the Jewish culture, kosher culture, no one's raising pigs, especially 2,000 of them. But he goes across the, the, um, the lake and he finds this, you know, this man that meets him on the shore. And as far as we know, at the end of the story, Jesus gets back in the boat and goes across. So he really only has this one encounter. Think about that. Jesus, teaching all kinds of people all day, tired, calling a storm, now goes over and meets one person. Why does he do that? And what is the impact of that? Um, so he goes across, and what he does is he not only casts the demons out of him, and if you've never, in our culture, we're not really used to talking about demons. Right? I've seen, I have seen someone demon possessed. It is scary. There is supernatural power going on. There is all kinds of stuff. It, it destroys people. Um, it usually leads to the person killing themselves, right? That cutting of the skin, throwing themselves down. And think about where that man was living. He was living in tombs. He was living near dead people. He, the the society didn't know what to do with him, so they tried to tie him up, and he was able to get away from that. He was desperate. Right? He was desperate. But what does Jesus do? Jesus not only frees him and sets him free, he sends him as a missionary to the entire region. One person. He healed only him. The other people heard the message. We only have the story of he, he healed him. He sets him free. He puts him in his right mind. And then he gives him a job to do. He says, no, go out and tell others. And when he says the Decapolis, you know what that is? That's ten cities. That's the whole region. The entire region. He was expected to go share the good news of what Jesus had done for him. And then he got Jesus got back in the boat and left because the people asked him to leave. They were terrified. They might have been terrified because they, they didn't know who he was. They had no encounter with the God of Israel, right? They worshipped all these pagan gods. It was They might have been upset about, you know, they lost pigs and the economics. We're not really quite sure. But Jesus has this one encounter, cares enough about this one man, that he exercises power of the demonic, right, to set him free. Jesus established not only his ability to do so, but also his desire as God to reach all people. So a couple things that we just want to key points here, and then we'll go to the last section. The demons recognize his authority and testify to his identity, right? He gets off the boat. It's the demon that calls him the Most High God. And this is because Scripture is very clear that at the name of, when Jesus asserts his authority, 
the demons will always fall. Right? Satan is given power. He's limited power. God has all power. So he establishes the demons establish. <laughs> it's clear in the story that he is established as the son of God. He is God. Jesus shows his power and he delivers the man and he shows he's God. He sets him free. It's drastic. He's no longer living among the tombs. The Jews with him would have just hated that. He's living an impure life. He's living among dead people. He's doing these disgusting things to his body. The fact that he's sitting there with clothes later makes it seem like he probably didn't have clothes, right? In a moment, his life is completely transformed and not only is he saved, he's sent out. He tries to get in the boat and go with Jesus. Jesus says, you don't know if you need to come with me. Go out. Go out and tell everybody here. I mean, he says that. For some of those cities that he goes out to see, those ten cities, Decapolis, are cities that we see later in, in the rest of Scripture. Philadelphia is one of the ten cities that he was sent to, um, to tell the, and, and that's part of um, the early church, right? The, that Greek part of the early church. So Jesus shows, cares compassionately about this man, and then he sends him out to testify. All right, the last section, there's two healings, and they're put together in this last section of Scripture. So we're going to go through them quickly. Is this getting too long? We're good? Are we able to go through it? Okay. Yeah, I, got, I got a long passage this week. But I want to just stress again, Jesus first starts his power over nature um, and then over the demonic. And I want you to know, is when he healed that demonic, he didn't have to conjure up faith. He had faith in Jesus right away. So much so that he was willing to follow him wherever he went. And then go without him to tell others about him. So the last passage, Mark 5, 21-43. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders, named Jairus, came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded honestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. So here, let's look at that map again. We start, Jesus starts somewhere over here. That night he goes over here. He runs into the demon possessed man. They get right back in the boat and they end up right here from her him, probably. Like, that's the best historical guess because he based himself uh, mostly in Capernaum at this time during this part, portion of his ministry. So he's right back to where he started. Think about how tired he was, right? And you have to think about how much power he's showing his disciples and those around him to establish his authority. So, it looks like he's going to the house of Jairus, right? However, the story gets interrupted. We're going to continue with Mark 5. A large crowd of people Jesus and pressed around him. And a woman who... A woman who has been who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Because she thought, if I could just touch his cloak, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from suffering. And once Jesus realized that power had gone out from him, he turned around in the crowd and asked to touch my cloak. You see the people crowding around against you, the disciples answered, and yet you can ask to touch me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what, was hap- what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. What do we learn about this woman? She was desperate for healing. She was suffering in her body, um, so much so that she had sought out doctors, and instead of getting better, she ended up being physically worse, and she ended up without any money. So imagine being a woman in that culture without money, without resources. Um, women were not value at all in the culture, and they really needed the protection of family. And we see this woman who's alone, um, sick, without any resources. And not only that, she was Jewish because this was the area of Galilee where Jews lived. She had um, a bleeding disorder. And under the Old Testament law, she was considered impure. Women that were bleeding, if it could not be controlled, could not come into religious spaces. They could not come into contact with other people. And the way the Pharisees interpreted their law, it really meant that she was often living probably alone without any comfort or care. So she is desperate. And she may have even been taking a risk trying to come out into her crowd, knowing that she could have been branded as impure and disobeying the law. 
However, what's important is her faith is in the person of Jesus. If I can just get to him, I will be healed. She does not ask him to pray for her. She does not even try to talk to him. She just wants to get near him, right? And Jesus responds. And I think there's so much beauty in this. Jesus was called by Jairus, who was one of the religious leaders at the synagogue. He was important. Everybody was watching what he was going to do to get to the house of the synagogue leader with the sick daughter, right? He's somebody that could have given Jesus some credibility. He's someone that could have said, oh, Jesus is real. He could have, Jairus was somebody that could have testified, right? And he stopped that. And he looks at somebody nobody else would have looked at. Somebody on the outside, someone suffering. And not only does he, he doesn't know what it is, he's asking, who is it? He stops his way to the house of a dying child from somebody that's respectable to take care of somebody that had been left alone and really had been misused, from what we can tell, right? Because the doctors took her money and left her worse off. He delays because he cares about her. He has compassion. He doesn't care about the bleeding. He just cares that he reaches her. And, and at first... And that's the key point. We can look at the power of God does heal her, right? When it's just, the power goes out of him, and it's another sign. Mark gives us this detail to say this is another evidence that Jesus is God. And let me tell you the story about how he got in the boat and he calmed the storm. Let me tell you the story about how he delivered someone from a demon. Now let me tell you about this woman who was bleeding, and he healed her even when he didn't know she was seeking him. It's an affirmation he's God. But even when Jesus goes to look for her, she becomes afraid. Her faith is so strong that instead of running away, say, I got healed, I'm running away, I can't deal with this. She's trembling. She still submits to him, right, and, and recognizes who he is. And it teaches us, that her, as much as she wanted to be healed, and she was desperate to be healed, let's be honest, but she was desperate. Her faith was in the one who healed her. Because she could have left. She got her healed. But she stood in front of a whole crowd and recounted why she did what she did. And Jesus then responds, your faith has healed her. It's the faith in him. She recognized that he is God, right? That he has the power to touch her body. So let's go to the last part. Jesus doesn't give up on Jairus. He took a little detour and he helped this woman. And now the fourth miracle that we see in this very short passage of Scripture. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. The daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told Jairus, Don't be afraid. Just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly, which was a custom of the day, part of the morning cycle. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he had put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha Puam, which means, Little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around the room, walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. On the road, those voices around the crowd, right? Don't bother coming. There was already that unbelief in the crowd. Don't bother coming. Your daughter's already died. And Jesus turns to Jairus and says, Don't be afraid. Just believe. He doesn't tell Jairus to believe in the miracle. He just says, Just believe. Follow me. Right? And Jairus does. That's a key point here. In the face of the suffering, Jairus goes to the one that he knows has the power to, to meet his need. And then the, when he goes into that room, Jesus showing the compassion. Don't you just love that detail? Mark puts it in. He takes her by the hand. Again, little girls, she has some privilege because her father had power in the culture. But she was a girl, not, not a son, not somebody wealthy, right? But he takes her by the hand, and he says, little girl. And one of the commentators said it's kind of like using the term dear or honey, <laughs> right? Sweetie, you know, a term of endearment. He takes her by the hand, and he raises her up. 
He shows his authority over death. And some people say, well, was she really dead because he said she was asleep? I'm not sure if she was in a coma or she was all the way dead. The Bible doesn't really tell us. The fact that if he hadn't taken her by the hand and raised her up, she, she would be buried soon. Right? They're ready to mourn her. And he raises her up. And yet the difference in this story, I think this should sober us a lot. Remember when he healed the demonic man? What did he tell him to do? Go to everybody. Go to ten cities. You go to all these Gentiles that don't have, even know about, about the God of the Old Testament, who I am. You go tell them. But here he tells them not to say anything. And he tells them not to say anything because he was surrounded by people that already did not believe in who he was. We already learned a couple chapters ago, right, when he performed other miracles, they said, you're doing that by the power of Satan. He was surrounded by people who laughed when he showed up to the house. He was surrounded by people who did not have faith. And Jesus was on a mission to accomplish his father's purposes. This was early in his ministry, but he knew uh, that the, the tide was turning against him in Galilee. So, four stories, four miracles, right? A miracle of our nature. Um, can you imagine if suddenly we were out all together on a cruise and our boat was about to go down and someone just said, stood up, stop, and we were all like, what? <laughs> that would change our lives. Power over nature. And it wasn't just a random power, it was the sea. Everybody knew what that meant. He was God, right? Power over um, demonic, right? They eliminated the power of evil. And we know one day he limits the power of evil because he becomes like Jonah and goes down into death and conquers death, right? Conquers Satan once and for all. And the power over the body, right? He heals and he even keeps someone from death. That is the Jesus we serve. So how do we respond today in 21st century, in 2022? How do we respond to what the Gospel of Mark says, the story of Mark? And I believe it's very similar to what the disciples had to decide and what the followers had to decide, what the demonic man had to decide, what the woman that was bleeding had to decide. Do we believe that Jesus is God? That's the message. Jesus is God. He has all authority, all power. Do we believe, even when we don't see it, even when the storm comes, even when we're sick, do we believe that Jesus is God? If we don't, we got to wrestle with that. We have to say, God, give me faith to believe in who you are. If you lack faith, ask. Jesus is not just some nice teacher, somebody who was kind and gave the Sermon on the Mount, gave us some good values to live by. Jesus was God himself who came into the world for a purpose to save people. Right? And that goes to the second point. that the, We see his love all over these stories, right? The love for that man that nobody else could control, and a love to send them out and include him, right? A love for his disciples, that even when they weren't letting him sleep, he, he was God. He was going to control the situation. So one way or another, he wasn't going down. He still calmed the storm, and he still continued on. A love for the woman who was suffering, a love for that child and her family. We need to acknowledge that not only is Jesus God, that he has the power, the power of his love saved us. That same power that stopped the storm is the power coming from his heart of love to bring us into salvation with him. We are, we are destined for, we're lost in our sin and we're destined for death, right? And when Jesus comes in, he breaks that power out of his love for us. And then, once we acknowledge that we need to follow him with full assurance that whatever we face in this life, he has all power. The big word that we teach kids is omnipotent, um, omnipotent, omnipotent, meaning Jesus has all power. There's nothing he can or cannot do. If we don't see that power, we still know who he is. Do you not have faith? Right? Do we not have faith? When life is overwhelming, when we're suffering, do we turn to the person of Jesus and say, I rest in you. My faith is in you, even if I cannot see. And then last, we tell others of his loving power, mercy, and goodness. Like that demonic man. That when I read that last night again, I was just wanting to stand up and shout. He imagined a freedom, suddenly freedom. Who wouldn't want to tell everybody? When we recognize that that same God has delivered us, that we were just as lost as that man out running in the tombs, cutting himself. We were just as lost. But God has set us free. Our heart is to tell others about him. And that's what resurrection life is all about, right? Reach, teach, and send. It's the gospel. It's the good news of Jesus. And I, I believe that's what Mark wants us to know today, just like he wanted the first church to know. This is 
this is the God who saves. And we can respond or not respond to him. Amen? And it's time for the benediction. Thank you for allowing me to a little bit more time. Thank you, Candace. It's been an occasion of faith, hasn't it? Would you stand with me, please, as I read the benediction? I know before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that with his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may fill that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to the power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.